and I would like to welcome His Excellency Prince Faisal bin Farhan Al Saud to this forum at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. We've had a very lively discussion beginning with an intervention by the Foreign Minister of Iran, Mohammad Javad Zarif. He had expressed his desire to have been together with you in this room, but said that unfortunately protocol did not make it uh, possible. You've now been in the job three to four months as the foreign minister of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Coincidentally or not, that seems to have coincided with a time where the general impression is that Saudi Arabia is looking at dialogue in a much more significant way, whether it's with Iran, whether it's with Qatar, whether it's on Yemen. Would you say there has been a shift in the strategy of the kingdom? No, I wouldn't say that. I think we've always favored dialogue with those that are interested in dialogue uh, that will lead to actual results and actual resolution. Okay, let's take one example. Uh, Javed Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, said that you had, that Saudi Arabia had sent a message to Iran after the targeted killing of Qasem Soleimani. He said Iran responded immediately, but then there was silence. What happened? So the only messages we have sent are those that everyone has seen in public. We have sent no private messages to Iran, and our message is quite clear. Uh, you know, Iran, even before the killing of Qasem Soleimani, Iran attacked our oil facilities. They sh shot 16 missiles at them, endangering the global economy. Iran has been supplying the Houthis with ballistic missiles and other weapons that have been fired at our civilian cities. So uh, our message to Iran has always been that once they are willing to admit that their regional behavior is the main source of instability and that activities such as firing ballistic missiles at your neighboring states is not contributory to security, then we can discuss the potential of talks. The issues which divide Iran and Saudi Arabia, you know better than most, are on a lot of different levels. There's a very difficult political issues, but then there are the issues of how to minimize the possibility of an accidental confrontation, the risks of war, etc. After the attacks on your oil installations in September, there was an impression that you looked more seriously at trying to find ways to engage, not at the top level, but opening up direct and indirect contacts. Would you say that was the case? Again, I'm gonna uh, say the same thing I said. We've always been interested in finding ways to de-escalate de de the situation in the region. This is not something, this is There was a sense that, that there was a wake-up call. What happened in, there was a spectacular attack on your oil, your production facilities. I think you'd agree. Uh, it was which, very, must have, which made people very nervous. It was very spectacular, and it rightly made people very nervous. It made uh, people very nervous about uh, the recklessness of Iran and its willingness to attack uh, the global economy, not just the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's neighbors, for no reason, honestly. So, uh, yes, we called after the attacks for uh, de-escalation and for, for avoiding any further military confrontation, but we had not been calling for military confrontation before the attack, so that there was no change. The only change was that Iran had escalated its aggressive activity. So what do you, when you were asked about this at Davos, you said it's up to you to when uh, Javed Zarif tweeted about being open to dialogue with our neighbors, complementary ways of reducing tensions, you said it's up to you, that you were also interested. Sure. So Absolutely. where would you begin? You have to begin at a lower level. You're not, unless, it's not expected that you will have meetings with Java City. Where are there intelligence contacts now that are useful? Again, uh, there are no direct contacts as of yet. We none. are none, that, none but uh, that's not the point. The point is, uh, what are the basis for any contacts? What are the basis for talks? Uh, you know, can we find... Uh, a mutual understanding for at least what is the cause of instability. If we're going to talk past each other, there's no point to talking. And, you know, and uh, we have a situation where uh, we are constantly being told that we should talk about a regional security architecture, we should talk mm -hmm. about uh, mutual, but there is only one party in the region that is actively contributing to that instability. And until 
you know, we can talk about the real causes and the real sources of that instability, uh, uh, talk is going to be very, uh, counterproductive. Has there been a change in your approach to Yemen? Now there we do understand that there are high level direct talks between the kingdom and the Houthi officials at a senior level and that there are also indirect talks. I, my understanding, we've been told that that has collapsed but there has been a channel that has been developed. Is that the case? So that's absolutely the case. Uh, since our intervention in Yemen, we have always said that we favor a political resolution and we've favored every uh, political dialogue that was uh, uh, shepherded by whether it's uh, the Martin Griffith or his predecessor, and we we'll continue to support that. It's not a shift uh, from the Saudi side. Actually, we saw uh, after the September attacks on our oil facilities uh, where the Iranians attacked the facilities, but then they asked the Houthis to take the blame for it. And I think that sent a wake-up call to uh, the Houthis that they are not partners with Iran, but they are tools for the Iranian regime to use as they see fit. Uh, and that was an incentive for the back channel, which was always present, to activate. And we continue to have that dialogue. There has been some recent escalation, but we are committed to finding a way forward if the Houthis are willing to focus uh, their attention on the, ben uh, on the interests of Yemen. So our message has always been consistent to the Houthis and to all parties in Yemen, that you should work towards bettering Yemen and towards the interests of Yemen. We may differ on what is in the best interest of Yemen, but that is an argument that is worth having rather than actuating uh, the agendas of regional players. You have indeed, and we've all heard you talking, successive, you know, many Saudi officials talking about the importance of a political solution, but prosecuting the war on the ground. The impression is that this is something new that the talks are even at the level of the Deputy Defence Minister, Prince Khalid bin Salman, which is very significant, talking directly to senior Houthi officials. Did that channel make progress? So we have a back channel, and that is at a working level. It's best not to describe at what level it is at this point, I, you know, but it's still in a back channel level. It's not yet uh, ready to move to the highest level. I think it's making progress. We have seen some um, deterioration recently, but we are committed to pushing it forward. However, we will, of course, if there is provocation on the ground, we will have to respond. But we are working very, very hard to find a way forward. Would you say with the military activity by the Houthis in recent weeks, which has caused Saudi Arabia, which, as you know, had reduced its bombardment to resume it again, would you say that is putting that channel under severe strain? So you're right, uh, we had come to the point where we had reduced our coalition air activity to by approximately 98%, so very, very significantly. Uh, we continue to be committed to the de-escalatory steps, although, as I said, we will respond when necessary, when there are provocations, whether on the front line or ballistic missiles fired into Saudi territory, which we saw recently. Uh, I don't think it's at the point yet where it's endangering uh, the back channel. Uh, but we are getting close to that. So it's important that uh, the international community as well focus the attention of uh, all parties in Yemen to the need to pursue the opportunity for a peaceful resolution. Is there a sense in which you want to, to use the phrase, take Yemen off the table? You are suffering both in terms of prosecuting the war. Yemen is suffering enormously. Your relations with your allies are suffering. You know, successive resolutions in the US Congress, as you know, calling for the end of U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia, which are used in Yemen. It's costing you dearly. Is that all part of why you'd like to resolve Yemen in some way as soon as possible? So our intervention in Yemen was based uh, on an understanding of uh, our national security interests. And we will always protect our national security and the security of our people. That said, again, we, from the beginning, favored a political resolution to the conflict in Yemen. It may be the case that now the, uh, the ground is more fertile for that political dialogue. As I said, the September attack contributed uh, very significantly to that. So I think it's more about the fact that the ground has been set for it. We have all, otherwise, I would say we had always supported uh, moving forward in a political dialogue, all the way to the Kuwait talks. I don't know if you remember. The, mm -hmm. uh, some, 100 uh, days in Kuwait. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So uh, that, you know, in that, that instance, we also very much favored a resolution. It was quite close but in the end it didn't work out. So it's, it requires all parties to contribute. It's not just up to Saudi Arabia. Remember the kingdom as part of the international coalition 
is there to support the legitimate government of Yemen, and we are not there as a party to the conflict, a direct party to the conflict. And uh, in the end, the Houthi movement also has to make a decision that they want to sue for peace rather than dominate the Yemeni scene by force and to impose their will on the people of Yemen. So you're confident with these initial contacts with the Houthis, you believe they do want to find a way out of the war. They want to make a deal with Saudi Arabia to end the war. So. And then to move on, of course, to broader talks across the country. Because from what we understand, you're, not discuss you're discussing a limited number of topics. I mean, anything we are talking about now is only to lay the groundwork for a dialogue between the Houthis and the government of Yemen. In the end, it will have to be resolved. As I said, we are there to support the government of Yemen. So any peace will come from an understanding between the Houthi movement and the government of Yemen and the other elements of the Yemeni uh, body politic. Uh, am I more optimistic now? I wouldn't say I am necessarily optimistic, but I'm hopeful, and we're going to push to achieve that goal. Uh, if that works, that, that, you know, that's really achieving what we want to achieve. How worried are you about your relations with Washington, given the criticism in the US Congress, given the across US society, not just about the devastating war in Yemen, but also the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, by Saudi agents in the consulate in Istanbul, all of these have really shattered some of your key relationships in, in the United States. How would you describe your relationships now? So uh, on the killing of uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, you know, we have taken uh, clear steps to address that. And I think it's only fair that people were shocked and that people uh, uh, had a very negative reaction to that killing. That's really appropriate and we understand that and we have taken the necessary steps we feel although many say you haven't done enough that's their opinion but we have done what we think is necessary and appropriate given the evidence we have received from the turkish side we have received very little cooperation in that regard uh, but in the end we understand where that reaction came from the relationship with uh, washington i think is Good. We have, of course, a very good relationship with uh, the administration, but we also have a strong dialogue with both parties in Congress. And we are, you know, the, the benefits of having such a strong strategic partnership is that we can have honest and open discussions. And there will be times when we agree and there will be times when we disagree. But we will continue to address the very real joint interests that we have and the very real joint uh, uh, benefits that have come out of the long-term relationship that the US and the Kingdom have. And I think my impression, I was just in Washington, actually I came he here from Washington, uh, is that there remains a bi bipartisan understanding of that. Uh, and I think that will continue to go forward. And what is your message to Washington when it comes to the, the fear about an escalation in the Gulf that could affect Saudi Arabia and the region? What is the message? What are you expecting from Washington? So I think we are basically on the same page with the Trump administration. When we have our discussions with the Trump administration, they quite clearly say that they are not interested in a military escalation. And if there is any escalation, it will come from the Iranian side. Of course, uh, they will def the US will react and defend its, uh, uh, its troops. We will defend ourselves if we have to. We certainly don't want it to get to that. And I think that dialogue is there. And uh, the intent is to push the Iranians to talks and to resolve the concerns, whether it is about uh, the nuclear program or the regional uh, malign activities or the ballistic missile program, through uh, dialogue. And um, all I can see from the Trump administration is that they are also interested in dialogue. Remember, uh, President Trump was willing to meet with Rouhani in New York during the UNGA. It was President Rouhani who decided not to meet him. Well, it's, it was not that simple. I think they, they wanted some preparation and they wanted to know that it would be more than a photo op opportunity. But look, just drawing this to a close, we've had one speaker after another talking about the danger in the Gulf region because of these unresolved tensions. How would you describe now this moment in terms of the, the atmosphere in the region? I think there is still tension and there is still danger, but we have to work to mitigate that. And one way is for the international community to stand together. We were actually uh, gratified that after the September attacks, for instance, the Europeans took a very strong position to condemn uh, Iran's role in that. And I think uh, sending a clear signal to Iran that uh, no escalation is necessary is important. But I'd also like to point out that there are some positive signs uh, in the region, whether it's for us in the kingdom where we have uh, Vision 2030 moving forward, where we have 
you know, if you look at the domestic scene, if you look at uh, the, the really re-energizing of the economy, of the society, all of these things, there are things that are happening positively. Also, we can look regionally, if you look at the transition in Sudan, for instance, that's something that's very successful. So it's not all tension and uh, negativity in the region. There are also some positive signs, and we should build on those uh, and not just focus on the risks and the dangers. And indeed, because you are now heading the G20, you will be hosting G20 members in Riyadh in, in November. Perhaps we could use the opportunity of the Munich Security Forum to ask you what else can we expect from the kingdom? There are many who say, well, if you want to really to have this privilege of hosting G20, there should also be progress in civil and political liberties in, in Saudi Arabia. The jailing of dissidents, uh, the arbitrary arrest, is there going to be action on that as well? So we're very proud of the opportunity to host uh, the G20. We have a very ambitious agenda, uh, which is all about addressing the concerns of the global community and offering access and opportunity and uh, taking advantage of uh, the opportunities of the 21st century and offering access that to all, whether it's climate change, empowerment, all of these things. So I think uh, people will get a very, very positive impression when they visit Riyadh. Uh, one of the important things is that we think that uh, we estimate there are about 50,000 people going to visit the kingdom uh, as part of the preparations for the G20. And I think it's very important that they come and judge for themselves what progress we have been making on many fronts, whether it is the empowerment of women, whether it's the access to the workforce, whether it's uh, 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 access to opportunities for all, all of these things. Uh, it's very, you know, it's a great opportunity uh, on the issues you mentioned. These are domestic issues that we, uh, you know, we work on and we improve. Uh, when there are court cases, that's up to the courts and we should let the courts decide. Uh, uh, and as we have seen with women's rights, these are issues that we will address at a pace that suits our society. Yes, well, we've all seen the dramatic changes when it comes to liberties, certain liberties in, in Saudi Arabia, but I think many would want, most of all, your citizens to see equal progress on other, in other ways as well, when it comes to civil liberties and the, the freedom of activists to be able to, like the activists who are in prison now. Well, uh, anybody who is uh, in jail has been charged with a crime according to our laws, and people in the kingdom will have to abide uh, by the laws. This is the same everywhere. Uh, and if there is a need to change with the laws, this is a dialogue we will have internally. Prince Faisal, thank you very much. We could, we could speak for a lot longer, but I think we should all thank you for joining us here in, in Munich. Thank you.